Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you speak to us today. This not be of our own, done through the flesh, but through your Spirit. Talk to us of your ways. Within our Lord Yeshua, we pray. Amen. In Ezra 2.68, we see, And some of the heads of the father's households, when they arrived at the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, offered willingly for the house of God to restore it on its foundation. We at this time in this country, in this world, the foundations have been torn out. They've been done away with. And we, as they, must begin to reestablish the foundations. And we've gotten away from the things that simply are the foundation of our faith. We've turned Christianity, true Christianity, into a religion. We've turned it into entertainment. We've turned it into uh, simply a, a social function. It is not, I'm not here because I have it together. In fact, I, I, there's probably not any area in my life that you could say that I could not tell you fully that I have failed. I have not arrived. Jesus never said narrow is the place when you get there. He said narrow is the way. We are simply here to, to share with you the story, the biblical uh, reasons for why we think that the uh, foundations have crumbled and how you as an individual believer in the Lord can again uh, reestablish the foundations. I often look for the breach in where we would see the problems, where the person had exchanged love for lust, that it exchanged uh, selflessness for selfishness. And the more I looked and the more I spent time in Scripture, the more I realized it was me. In Matthew chapter 7, our Lord tells us, Do not judge, lest you be judged. For in the way that you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye and do not notice the log that is in your own. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye. And here we see our Lord telling us in this next verse, the key to effective ministry. I'm afraid we often read this verse as something that's a curse, that's a warning to us, and it's actually a promise. He says the following, the first thing, you hypocrite. We need to accept that we are undone. As a human, I am a hypocrite. And in that hypocrisy, I do not have the right to judge somebody. But he goes on and he says, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will clear, see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And this is a promise. If we will work on getting the, the, the speck out of our own eye and uh, be able to see clearly. I would not even seen that particular insight if I had not begun to follow the principle that we're talking about today. It is, I believe, personally in Scripture because it is mentioned all over the place from the beginning to the end, uh, the most important principle that we can have. Everything is based on this. You will see as we go through that faith is based on this, Prayer is based on this. Um, we, uh, our, our relationship with God is based on this. And this is a principle that is non-optional. Now, we hear the words non-optional quite often, and people will give it a lot of hyperbole, but that's not what we're talking about here. This truly is non-optional. We unfortunately have decided that non-optional doesn't mean it. And this is one that you can argue with me all day, but I'm going to be telling you, if you're a Bible believer, you will find that, that what I'm going to be telling you is simply unarguable. Um, 
I wound up at a men's conference one time and I, I wound up uh, speaking with a man that was sitting beside me in a vehicle as we were going somewhere. And he was uh, a chaplain in the service and he had participated in some maneuvers in which two branches of the service were working together. And the one, one branch was gonna be coming over with uh, bombs and uh, the other branch was supposed to be on the ground and it was supposed to be working together. And, uh, and I, I'm sorry, there were three branches. The third person was, was on the ground there too. And as one of the planes went over, something happened and a bomb inadvertently fell out. And the leader of one of the branches that was on the ground yelled one word. That word was incoming. And everyone around him that had, had the non-optional training of hearing the master's voice dropped immediately to the ground and laid as, as close and as flat as they possibly could. The person that was there from the other branch of the service turned around to see what was incoming. It was the last thing he did. It was non-optional. The training that he should have had was non-optional. Jesus tells us in casting out a demon out of someone that this kind only comes out with prayer and fasting. And we need to notice there was something that Jesus did not do. He did not say, I need to go away and begin to pray and fast. Fruit that is, is from our Lord is slow. And uh, we are, as Christians, we should be um, working on these things always in our life, knowing we never know when we will be called to stand up and speak for the Lord. Years ago, uh, I was, my wife and I were living the lives of a normal American Christian. Uh, we were, uh, I was a deacon in a fairly large church, about 1,500 people. And our standard, though, of measurement of where we were in our lives was other people. And yeah, I had a problem with anger, a problem with lust, a problem relating to the family, had no prayer life. I was overcome easily by sin. My life was compromised and I had a horrible relationship with God. Past that, everything was just great. But as long as you're looking at other people, well, what happens is, is that you wind up with, well, that person over there's got some issues, but this one over here, uh, I'm a little bit better than, oh, those, those, I wish I was as good as them. And it's all wrong. In Matthew chapter six, um, as I was working on this, this project, the Lord showed something to us. And uh, I want to read, starting in verse 22, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is clear, King James says single, and, and actually the Greek says single too, therefore your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Therefore, if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? That is one of the scariest scriptures that you can possibly imagine. Jesus is saying to us, um, if your eyes clear or single, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes bad, it'll be full of darkness. But then he says, if the light that is in you is darkness. In other words, the things that you believe to be true are not true. How great is that darkness? The reason is, is because you believe things that are lies and you believe that they are true. I'm afraid that is in all of our lives. He goes on in verse 24, and this is where we want to focus the most. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. I have looked at these verses so many times, I think, and I certainly have heard them taught this way, that 
these are uh, parallels that he starts out with saying, uh, it's, he's saying no one can serve two masters and for he'll hate the one and love the other. And we look at it and we've been taught, well, the second thing, he's saying the same thing, just describing it better. He'll hold to one and despise one. But that's not the way it puts it. Let's look again here. No one, first, no one can serve two masters. The focus here is on ineffective service. Uh, you can't serve two masters. If you're trying to do that, one is going to be missing out somehow. A master is an absolute authority. And equal authorities will never have the same goals. There are individuals, and, and as individuals, they're going to come up with something that there's going to be strife there. God is one authority, is a master, and mammon is another authority, uh, is a master. But the way that it puts it there is that um, no one can serve two masters. And then it says, for either. Now, this is interesting, and we do have that uh, this diagram up for either and the word either means we've come to a choice and I remember the day that I was looking at this verse and I was shocked as the Holy Spirit began to say look at the connecting words these small words in here that mean so much he says first either so he's giving us two choices not just describing the, the same thing he's giving two choices here and he says, he will. Now, that's important because, honestly, the more we grow in the Lord, the more we realize, or should be realizing, that our will is what our Father is after. Uh, my will before his is the way we normally walk. But we should be putting our will subservient to God. And that's what he says, and actually the first choice. He says, either he will hate one, and hate is complete rejection, and love one. He will hate one and love the other. The, the word love, I want to talk about that for a second, is that in the Greek, it's the word agape. And we know that that is the perfect love that our Lord desires us to be walking in. And that love is not an, a, uh, a love of emotion, which is unstable, but is a love of willfulness, of focus, of volition. I choose to do what is best for the person or object loved, and I am to die to what I want. And the, it's interesting in the Greek that we, we, if you look up love, that's what you find out. But the word in the Greek here for hate is not an emotional word. So many things in Scripture, we unfortunately uh, define them emotionally. And love here is not an emotional love, but rather a volitional love. And the word hate is actually defined as the complete absence of this volitional love, of agape love. And so again, that hate is not something that I feel that is something that is expressed emotionally. And that's difficult for us to understand, but it's because we don't understand what agape means. So let's, let's think about this, and let me give you kind of a story just a, not a story, but at least an example, that I have understood I never loved my wife until I learned to, to truly say, I have a volitional love toward her. And what that means is, is my face is turned toward her and away from all other women. They are, they are nothing. I don't have an emotional reaction to them. It simply means that in comparison to my wife, they're nothing. They are non-existent. My face is turned toward her and not toward others. And I don't have anything against them, but it's simply that all of my 
for someone is willfully, volitionally toward my wife. And that is what we see here. For either he will love the one, and loving, uh, remember the greatest commandment is that we love with all. We love Yahweh with all. And uh, we have the choice now, though, of loving with all and. And so it's, it's interesting. It's interesting for us to understand that the hate is complete rejection. But now it's important that we understand, too, that we are now looking at the first choice our Lord says. Either he will hate one and love the other. Now, the word and is an inclusive conjunction. And I don't want to get into a whole lot of grammar, please. But the, the word and there is I can have an apple and an orange. And so what happens is I love the one and simultaneously hate all the others. And this is the, the picture that God is trying to give us. Because the first choice is the one he wants us uh, having in our own lives for him. That we love him and hate all others. And that is the focus he desires. But it's interesting the way that it is put here. It says, for he will love the one and hate the other. And then he says, or. And we have... Again, this is this is interesting because the word or is an exclusive. I have an apple or an orange. I have one or the other. And so this tells us that he's these are not uh, it's not a parallelism as we see so often in the book of Proverbs, but that this is truly you are supposed to love one and hate the other. In other words, a complete demarcation. Of, of understanding that I am focused on the one to the exclusion of everything else. I love and hate simultaneously, or. And now we come to the second uh, of these, the verse there, and it says that uh, I will hold to one and hold and despise one. Now, I was, I was looking at that, I was, uh, me and meditating on it, I realized something, that I can, at the same time, and of course, this is what it's saying, the word and is in the middle, I can, at the same time, hold to somebody, and at the same time, despise somebody. Because holding on to someone is the way the scripture puts it here, is, is something that I can do emotionally and I can cling to somebody. And I think that that's a good thought that I, I'm clinging. But the problem with holding to someone, to clinging to them, is tells us actually something very profound in the way that we look at love the way we look at relationships. We so often will say, I love you. And those are good words, but if we were stopped to think about them, the word I is the subject of the sentence. I love. The you is the object. And now while that's important, the subject of I love you is me. It's, it's, it's me. And that's what, unfortunately, the holding to someone I hold to that person for whatever I can get out of them, and I'm clinging to them. And it's about me. It's not about an agape love. And this is our second choice. The second choice is, is that I'm holding to one person, uh, or holding to the object loved. And it is a, a focus on what I want, what I can get out of them. And now we have the inclusive again and despising one. Now despising, I had never thought about this, but the word hate that we see means I've turned away from that person completely. But interestingly, with the word despise, 
my despising of someone is an emotional uh, reaction to them. It, to despise someone, I'm not turned away from them. In fact, they're actually part of my focus. Now, it's interesting that in this, when I am holding to someone, at the same time, honestly, I'm despising them. Why? Because my desire is to, to use them. And so it appears like, oh, I love them, but I don't. Uh, the point is, is that I love, I love me, I want them. I want what they can give me. And that is, uh, is not a pure love. It is clinging to the person so I can get out of them, interestingly, and I am at the same time despising that person because I'm using them for what I want. And if I emotionally am despising them, first, I also at the same time have not released them emotionally. It's not a hatred that we see in the first choice that I turn away in an unemotional way. It's actually a despising of somebody is that when I am looking at them and my emotional focus is on that person. And so when we look at this, we see in the, the very first choice we have here is, again, a single-mindedness. But when we look at the other choice, holding to, why? So I can get what I want. Uh, clinging to, so I can get what I want. It's the same thing. I'm despising them. And our Lord is saying, you're going to have two choices. This is the way it's going to work with a master. You're either going to look at them and go, you've got my everything, to the exclusion of everybody else, or if I am serving you, but I'm serving you or giving uh, a flattery or, or sound like I am in love with you, I'm doing it, though, for what I want. Now, that is double-minded. We look at this. We are either going to serve with a wholeheartedness or we're going to serve with double-mindedness. And this is, remember, this is from our Creator God that is telling this. And we're either going to serve uh, wholeheartedly, single-mindedly, or we're going to serve double-mindedly. And uh, we try to mix the two. It's called compromise. If we ever look at the word, co-promise, two promises. I'm promised to two, but it's really not true. The day... Uh, in the garden, when the Lord said, don't eat of that tree, it is the knowledge, the knowing. In fact, in the Hebrew, the word is yada, which is a, a deep experiential knowing. In fact, it's the deepest experiential knowing. You will yada, what? Good and evil. It wasn't knowing the difference between good and evil. We often read it that way, but that's not what it says. It says that it was the yada, the deep experiential knowing of good, but also the knowing of evil. And it was the tree, I like to think of it this way, of double-mindedness. Um, we have in this verse that the Lord is telling us, you must serve wholeheartedly, single-focused, or you will serve in a double-minded fashion. And uh, if we were to, I, if I tell you, if you were to look at my life at that time, that uh, I had a, a gushy emotionalism on one side, but on the other, I would have an angry, cold heart. Um, I was always looking for the next feel-good experience but I had no true joy. I, I was very religious, but I had temporal values. I would despise God's law as well. That's too rigid, just like so many people do, but I would be very rigid with the parts of Scripture that I lacked. I lacked wisdom, but I was unteachable. I despised responsibility, but to other people, I was overbearing with my demands that they be responsible. I de-emphasized uh, God's holiness, 
And I over overemphasize grace and love, never even defining them and defining the way that, that so many people do, which means basically almost nothing. Um, I would emphasize faith, interestingly, but I lacked faith. Now, we look at this in James chapter 1, and if we were to look at my life, we would see, and this is, a, this is a, I believe, uh, James giving us a description of the double-mindedness, of a double-minded person, and this is certainly was me, where he says, uh, consider it all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing, and we don't, that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, that you'll be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you, and here's what it says, lack wisdom. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously and without reproach to all men, but let him ask in faith. I lacked wisdom and I lacked faith, but let him ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. I was I had doubts about God's ways, his willingness to bless and be in my life. And my life was, was driven by temporal wants. It was driven and tossed by worries. I had desires, but no true expectations from God. And in my double-mindedness, that results in instability in all of our ways. We have in this as we said, two choices, where God is saying, I want you to be focused on uh, loving me. And a word that we need to define right now is uh, the word repent. In the Greek, it meant to change your mind, to change your mind. And unfortunately, we have defined the word repent uh, in an emotional way. Well, did they cry a lot? Were they truly repentant? And I understand what you, you mean by that, but we've begun to say that's what repentance in the scripture means. It's not. It, to repent means to change your mind, to change your mind as literally as a way of life. <clears throat> we have a one-pronged gospel. Repent, repent, repent. Now, that should be, but it's not the emotional response, and I think probably everybody here is thought in different ways of working that up. How can I work up repentance? Working up that I've got enough emotional response. Well, it's not what you're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be changing our mind. We unfortunately wind up with, uh, focused on too much repentance, we wind up with despair. And I think we see now in today's church a reaction to <clears throat> many uh, Christian denominations and, and pastors where they were constantly demanding repentance and people were constantly in despair. And instead of uh, the good news that we are, we've been brought in by our repentance into the Lord. When I disciple people, and I think you'll find that we wind up with two kinds of people. One is somebody that's in despair, as we just talked about that. They'll think they'll never get good. Nothing is ever going to change. You could throw them a life jacket and they would not grab a hold of it. And they're the people that unfortunately will often waste your time. Uh, they require a lot of prayer. That's not a waste of time. But we unfortunately often get involved with these people trying to make them less in despair. And they will simply go, oh, nothing ever works out. But the other kind of person is the kind of person that you can begin to disciple. And that's somebody that's desperate. Someone in despair will look at the life rope that you've thrown them and they'll go, that's nice, it won't work for me. But someone that's desperate will grab a hold of the smallest straw. These people are folks that know they have a need. And that is something that scripture says, blessed are the poor the desperate, the, the uh, completely destitute in spirit. 
Theirs is the kingdom or kingship, I think is a better word for it, the kingship of God. God is able to rule over somebody that is desperate, that understands that their, uh, their life needs to become uh, and strengthened by God. Okay, so the problem we see is how, the problem is double-minded at first, but the problem then is how do we become single-minded? 